So thank you all for coming out. Uh, great to see such a big crowd on a midweek evening, especially for those of you who have young children, which is probably most of you. Uh, I have two grown children, and long ago and far away I had young children, and it's a wonderful, beautiful thing, and it's exhausting. So, uh, so bless you. Um, entrepreneurial mindset and Montessori. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean about entrepreneurial mindset, and then I'm going to talk about Montessori in a kind of a big picture way, sort of beyond um, just what you might think of as Montessori. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about my own story and how I got here and how I came to see the connections I do between my entrepreneurial mindset and Montessori. Um, and then ultimately, I'll talk through why I think this is uh, really, really important. And I will land the plane by claiming we, we collectively, all of us involved in this endeavor, are solving some of the most important problems of the 21st century, especially if we can share this with the whole world. And so, uh, you know, I think it was Lewis Carroll said something about, I try to believe three uh, unbelievable things before breakfast or something like that. I've mangled it. But uh, I'm going to have you guys believe three unbelievable things before you go home tonight. And if nothing else, you can have dreams about that crazy guy you listen to. So. Um, First of all, an entrepreneurial mindset. So I don't want to think just narrowly about entrepreneurs. I love entrepreneurs. I've got a lot of experience with all kinds of different entrepreneurs. Um, but I do think of it as more of a mindset. And a simple version that I'll start you off with is taking the initiative to create value. And I'll even make it magical, taking the initiative to create value that had not previously existed. So um, that may sound odd, but I'll give a really banal example. When I was in college, I worked at restaurants, uh, often washing dishes in summers to make money for college. Um, at one point, I was at a restaurant where I was the dishwasher. And between times, it was often slow. The dishwasher really got hit late in the evening. Early evening was relatively slowly. So I would start helping the prep cook chop veggies early in the evening. And I just got in the habit of doing that. Um, but at the end of the summer, when I wanted to go back to college, the, my employer, the restaurant owner, offered to double my salary if I didn't leave. Because basically, I'd gotten to the point where I was doing two jobs, a prep cook and a dishwasher, and they had always hired two people. And I was doing you know, both jobs simultaneously, and it was great for them. And then, you know, not a big deal. It's just, you know, I was hanging out, just washing dishes. Hey, let's chop some veggies, whatever. But uh, I had, in essence, been saving that company a salary. And by the end of the summer, it was so valuable, they wanted to double my salary. And not everybody can do that in every situation. But I think there are lots of opportunities. People that take initiative to get stuff done are really important in the world. Um, everything, everything. You know, I, I walk around uh, dazzled by the world every day. If you haven't seen Louis C.K.'s uh, Everything's Amazing and Nobody's Happy, it's a short video. But, you know, every, you know, I look at the lights. We have lights. You know, we have doors. We have floors. We have chairs. Um, we should all just be dazzled all the time. And all of this stuff that is everywhere around us that should be dazzling us all the time, somebody created. Somebody took the initiative to create it. Not just somebody, not one individual, but hundreds of people, thousands of people. There are engineers. I once met an engineer whose job it was. You know those uh, square fans that go in windows, very simple, cheap fans? I met an engineer whose job it was to optimize the cost and performance of the little screws in the motor motors of those um, fans. There were so many millions of units sold, it made sense to pay an engineer to do nothing but optimize the performance of the screws in the motors. Different case, um, BMW has sound engineers who specialize in the way the BMW door closes. And the whole experience, the sound experience of all aspects of the BMW, there are sound engineers that specialize in that. So all these things that we take for granted all day, every day, somebody figured out. And not just somebody, lots of people. And so for me, entrepreneurial value creation is people take an initiative to make things happen that would not have happened. Sounds like no big deal, but the difference between activity and being active and being passive, taking initiative, not taking initiative, um, thinking in new ways versus not, is everything. That's a whole ballgame. If we didn't have people in the past who had done that, and if we weren't grateful, we should be grateful every day for all the people in the past who have done that, because that, without that, nothing. So entrepreneurial mindset, really kind of abstract, but uh, it's a very banal thing. Every time you take initiative to make things better in some ways, that's a kind of entrepreneurial mindset. Montessori. So Montessori, 
Uh, I always pick on the pink tower. I don't know I pick on the pink tower, but some people think Montessori is the pink tower uh, or you know, whatever the equipment is. For me, Maria Montessori was a genius because she conceptualized education as a prepared environment where now the word curated is more trendy than prepared. So I like to say a curated environment. So you go into these gorgeous classrooms and there's these you know, curated environments where children, and as you now know, even young children, take initiative. I and mean, it's, you know, maybe you guys are already so used to it, but again, just like I'm dazzled by all this stuff, I think every adult in the US, probably in the world, should go see a Montessori classroom. Because a lot of times people don't believe it. Until you see little kids actually, you know, in charge, doing their own thing, walking around the rooms, no, no way, no way. Uh, Marie Montessori said her greatest sign of success is that children act as if she's not there. And I think that is the best metric of a great educator, is when the kids are acting on their own, doing constructive, valuable work, taking initiative to get stuff done on their own. Um, I think conceptualizing education like that was pure genius. We need a feature-length documentary on Montessori. We need a feature-length film uh, about Montessori's life, dramatized with you know, the you know, single motherhood and everything, and you know, all of her drama uh, going to India. It's a story. People don't think of Montessori as one of the great 21st century creators. She was one of the great innovators of the 21st century. If you think about it, most education is either uh, fairly top-down conventional or more recently, there's kind of unschooling and Sudbury Valley self-directed education, kind of do your own thing. Um, I will be very critical of conventional education, and I'm sure you know, many of you had a good time in conventional education, so good for you, I'm glad to do it. Uh, I'm gonna be very critical. You know, it's, it worked for some people some of the time, and it will continue to work for some people some of the time, but I think that um, that difference between being passive and being active, taking initiative or not, is so crucial that when Maria Montessori conceptualized education as this prepared environment within which you know, uh, architects, you know, educational architects, originally Montessori, now we're all extending that, uh, not only the materials, but the way in which the guides are trained to interact with children. I think part of her brilliance is the environment is not just the stuff around the sides of the room. The, the environment includes the human interactions. And it's a really subtle kind of nuanced thing, and I'll go more into that later. So for me, Maria Montessori was brilliant, not only, again, for that poor pink tower that, uh, you know, I think we, it's great, but it's not, the, it's not the big thing. The big thing is this thinking about education differently. And you know, in some ways, what I'm doing at the Academy of Thought and Industry is an extension of Montessori principles. Uh, Ray Gurdon likes to talk about it as autonomy and accountability, and I certainly like that description, and this kind of curated environment that allows for autonomy with accountability in a really constructive way uh, is brilliant. So that's entrepreneurial mindset. In brief, that's Montessori. In brief, now I'll kind of go into some background of how I see these two um, what on the surface of it might be very different things actually being really fundamentally similar in ways that are important to the whole world. Um, so going back just how I got involved in education, I had a high school class where, so I went to regular public schools and I was a good student. I was really good at what I call memorize and forget tests. You know, the night before, uh, you load it up, Get, go to spit it back on the test tomorrow, get my A, walk out of there, wash it out of my head, uh, live my life. You know, it's, it's a thing some of us are good at, some of us are not. Um, now I spend a lot of time helping you know, young people who might not be good at that, but for me, it's not magic, it's just I happen to be, have that ability. But I didn't feel like I was learning, really. I, in high school, I had a class as a junior where we simply read and talked about books and ideas. So uh, we read Plato and Martin Buber, and Nietzsche, and we talked and thought and argued about ideas, and I loved it. It was a blast. And all of a sudden, my mind was alive. I, I experienced intellectual agency for the first time. I realized once I had experienced intellectual agency that I could, I could have my own opinions and then I could talk and interact with adults who had respected my own opinions. Totally different ballgame. Henceforth, I had no patience for top-down lectures. I was of a bad conscience. Sorry, the sound guys for bumping the thing. I have a bad conscience whenever I'm lecturing because I like interactive uh, education. So I discovered St. John's College, a great books college with campuses in Santa Fe and Annapolis. And I uh, was going to drop out of my senior year of high school and go there. As it turned out, um, I had great SAT scores, so my counselor said, look, you can go to Harvard and you can get Greek, you can study Plato, you can study Shakespeare, you get that whole great books thing, plus you have a Harvard degree. 
So I we went to Harvard, and pretty soon I was bored by people talking at me. I just have no patience for it at all. So I we went to St. John's, graduated uh, from St. John's Santa Fe, loved it, and went to the University of Chicago, where at the time, Mortimer Adler, who was famous in the mid-20th century, he wrote a book called How to Read a Book, which is especially famous. He had created something called the Paideia Program. Paideia was an attempt to bring back the best of a kind of holistic cultural education that had existed in Greece and Rome. Uh, in some ways, there's a common period of Paideia culture from about Periclean Athens in 500 BC to really the fall of Rome. And the idea was really, it was not just education, it was about the whole human being. It was about becoming part of a culture, uh, learning to have certain norms, values, habits, attitudes. Aristotle talks about how we are habituated into behaving well. And so there was there very much that orientation. So uh, based on my experience as a Socratic seminar student at St. John's College, I began training teachers in Chicago public schools to lead Socratic seminars. At the time, I had never taken an education class, never had any training as a teacher. I was completely, by normal um, standards in the United States and the world, unqualified. Uh, but I loved what I did, and I went in there, and I got kids talking and thinking about ideas, and it was a blast. That led to me being hired as a full-time teacher trainer, Socratic teacher training or trainer in Alaska. Again, uh, I had a blast doing it. We were on grant money, and after three years on grant money, the grant money dried up, and we were out of jobs. And some parents came to me and said, we love what you're doing, will you start a private school? Up to that point, I had never been an entrepreneur in any sense, really. But uh, I said, sure, I don't have a job. You guys want me to start a private school? What's not to like? Um, and strangely, I went to some of my colleagues, and they were hesitant. They, were, you know, they didn't have jobs either, because they'd been working with me. They were like, well, I don't know. Should we or shouldn't we? I'm like, you guys, come on, this is crazy. Let's do this. So uh, by accident, I became an education entrepreneur. Uh, I had to figure out, oh, the teachers have to get paid. You know, before, the paychecks just arrived. All of a sudden, when you're running a business, you somehow need to get the money from here to there and do things in the process and so forth. So it was a great kind of crash course in educational entrepreneurship. Uh, again, no business school trainer or anything. You just do it. I uh, very much like the Nike slogan, just do it. From there, after getting that project going, I had given a talk. At this point, I was talking about my work in Socratic seminars. And I'd given a talk at St. John's College in Santa Fe. And a Montessori school, head of school in San Antonio, had heard it. And he invited me down to uh, what was then the Judson Montessori School in San Antonio to create a Montessori high school. And the connection there is there had been a trainer, a Montessori trainer, who trained under Maria Montessori in Mexico City. Her name was Nan Hanroth, Cato Hanroth. And she had seen kind of a philosophical, Socratic, personal growth secondary program as the obvious sequel to Montessori Elementary. And so she had begun moving in this direction. And there were a number of her students who were very interested in this kind of Montessori, especially Montessori secondary. Um, so as a consequence, uh, you know, I'd never heard of Montessori. You know, I'd heard of Montessori, but it was just a name. Well, probably a lot of you before you got into it, yeah, Montessori, whatever. Waldorf, strange things out there. Uh, but I read about it. I loved uh, Maria Montessori's book, The Montessori Method. And then when I got there, again, just beautiful. I'm, I'm still dazzled by the beauty of these classrooms. My children were young at the time, three and five, and so I had the great joy of working at a Montessori school and seeing my kids and you know, waving to them when I went by and so forth. And they flourished there. Uh, it was a beautiful experience. After a few years there, it turns out that institution was not ready to create a high school. Um, so I ended up Socratizing the program from pre-K through eight. Uh, I wrote a book on Socratic education and was doing in-service training to, with hundreds of public schools across the US. Um, but that was my first experience of you should interview your employer and not just have them interview you, because I didn't realize they weren't ready to create a high school. Um, but that's OK. Life is all about learning. That led to. Um, as I was writing this book and giving talks and so forth, a Chinese-Brazilian entrepreneur had wanted to create a high-end school for gifted children in South Florida. He had researched all of the schools in South Florida, public and private, and could find none of them that would be, allow his children to accelerate enough. So he hired me to create a school for highly gifted children. Um, again, no training in gifted, no, you know, none of this. I've, 
one of the reasons I'm into initiative is uh, everything was done by people just doing it. You know, uh, if you're waiting for the rules, if you're waiting for the credential, if you're waiting for permission, it's too late already. Uh, everybody who really does stuff just do, does it. You know, a nice little digression. Uh, people have this sort of founding fathers view of you know George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, all of this. When Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he was a 30-year-old red-headed hothead. You know, you, you think of probably some of the most immature 30-year-olds you know, you know, just that's, that's Jefferson saying, you know, get out of here, King George, we're gonna create our own country. He had no permission, he had no experience. Did anybody credential Thomas Jefferson to create a country? He was completely unqualified. This is just not right, you know, but he just did it. So when you start thinking about the history of innovation, and I'm very interested in the history of creation, innovation, and entrepreneurship, everything was created by people that just did it. So here I was creating a school in South Florida for uh, highly gifted kids, actually entrepreneurial stories. The founder, uh, or the grandfather, not the grandfather, the father of the man I worked with, had left Mao, left China when Mao took over, had gone to Brazil where they had not yet planted any soybeans. There was no soybean industry. He was the first one to plant soybeans in Brazil. Now Brazil is the second largest exporter of soybeans in the world. And that family's company is, of course, uh, leading you know, producers of soybean products. So you know, starting from zero is, has big payoffs if you can do it right. Um, so, but super entrepreneurial. Uh, we were very much interested in training kids to think, take initiative, um, understand the world, do stuff in the world. So in addition to the academic program, there's kind of an entrepreneurial strand to that. Um, his vision of the ideal education for a teenager, and we both knew we couldn't get away with doing this, uh, was to drop off a teen in a strange city with nothing and have them get to another point safely. <laughs> uh, but you know, you have to think on your feet. You know, it's sort of the ultimate in free range kids. You know, can they get through this alive? Um, but you know, thought experiments. We wanna, we wanna think about how do we give our kids real challenges to do real stuff. Uh, after that, I was hired to create Montessori Middle Schools in Palo Alto, a multi-campus organization that has schools in Palo Alto and Pleasanton. And again, there we had an entrepreneurial strand, a project strand, and a Socratic strand. Um, I, after that, I created a high school, a Socratic Paidea High School in Angel Fire, New Mexico. It was ranked the 36th best public high school in its third year of operation. Um, then I met John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, a founder and CEO. John had uh, you know, created a grocery store. Uh, I had created a bunch of little schools, and we both saw that entrepreneurship was this powerful force for doing good, and it really wasn't adequately recognized. There was kind of microfinance or social entrepreneurship. There were people you know, realizing that entrepreneurship was a force for good, but he and I had created an organization that uh, focused on entrepreneurial solutions to world problems, and as a consequence, uh, I met hundreds of the coolest entrepreneurs around the world doing amazing sorts of things. Um, just give you a few little samples. So, I hadn't thought of the need for um, you know, banking for the poor. Of course, microfinance is a form of bank, but I met a guy who created this device. This is 10 years ago, an electronic device that acted as a bank for poor people in India. And he, had, he was great, gaining a million clients a month in terms of poor people in poor cities who hitherto had had to carry cash around, but now there was a little electronic device that could make sure that they had their own bank accounts and you had all these little bankers. Um, Muhammad Yunus, one of the things he did, by the way, in addition to Grameen Bank, was uh, Grameen Phone, where they developed these cell phone ladies who would have a phone and sell minutes because poor people in Bangladesh couldn't afford their own phone, but they would uh, you know, sell so many minutes and they'd be a little entrepreneur uh, handing out their phone and making, making money off their phone uses. Um, I also met a woman who had basically created a city in a box for refugee, city in a box for refugee camps. So we think of refugee camps sometimes as temporary. There are people that have been three generations in refugee camps, and it's really, really horrible. Um, and often these, initially, they are just you know, tents and makeshift and so forth, but because there's this global need for high quality infrastructure for refugee camps, this woman's a British architect, she has a whole system that's quite fast, cheap, quick, simple, where it has plumbing and sewage and it has structures and everybody can quickly have a nice home. You no, know, they're small and simple, but a reasonably nice home uh, in this 
you know, refugee camp in a box thing. I would never have thought of that as a particular need, but apparently it was. And you have people out there creating stuff like this. So when you start to look at what the needs are and you become creative about, become creative about it, there are lots of opportunities for people to do things that make the world better. I'll give you two more examples. I, I actually met a couple of companies that were selling um, solar lamps in India. Both cases were in India. Because one of the biggest sources of, of death from indoor pollution is the uh, you know, kerosene or whatever they're br breathing to cook inside. And it's really horrible for the lungs. Um, but it turns out not to be too hard to have an affordable solar stove that can be you know, energized with the sun and then provide adequate cooking and heating so you don't need to be burning kerosene inside your home all the time and destroy the lungs of yourself and your kids. In a way, simple, but uh, you know, important. One of the innovations they actually have to do for that one is financing. So it turns out that this is cheaper than kerosene, but only if you uh, can you know, amortize the cost over a certain period of time. And for poor people, that's not easy. So they had to work with microfinance organizations to create the financing so they could buy, buy, the, buy the solar lamps. But these are people are out, out there solving problems by thinking like this. And it's a beautiful world, uh, really, really wonderful. A different example is um, most irrigation equipment is, uh, for agriculture is done for big commercial farmers like Central Valley. Uh, I know somebody who does nothing but miniaturize, so to speak, uh, state-of-the-art cutting-edge irrigation equipment so small local farmers can afford it. So I'll give you one more. This one is fun. Um, washing machines. <laughs> Hans Rosling, uh, who unfortunately is dead, has one of the most beautiful videos. Wonderful, wonderful guy about how much better the world's becoming. But he has something on the washing machine and how the washing machine has probably done more for women than just about anything. I mean, in a traditional society, washing is a really, really, I mean, you know, washing's work, but without a washing machine, it's a really a lot of work. And so I know some uh, entrepreneur in Guatemala who created this uh, kind of bucket that goes in the back of a bicycle. And so um, you hook it up to the bicycle, you put your clothes and detergent in there, and you pedal. And we went to a Guatemalan village where we were demonstrating, it, and the women were in a long line, really eager to try this out. They just thought it was so cool and couldn't wait to get it. And so uh, you know, I was immersed in this world of people doing amazing things entrepreneurially. Um, that led to you know, conscious capitalism as a spin-off, peace through commerce, radical social entrepreneurs. We created lots of organizations to promote this stuff. And then four years ago, I got back into education. It turned out to be a good time. My wife is a Senegalese entrepreneur, and she had a chemist in Austin, Texas. And uh, I had a partner who, with whom I'd created, uh, been on the board of a previous school. So I created a school in Austin, Texas four years ago that was also uh, focused on entrepreneurship and the Socratic piece, SAT and AP, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but that got me into really seriously developing young people to do entrepreneurial projects. And, and now I want to switch a little bit to going back to the theme, given that kind of background. And the reason I'll, well, I'll do one more piece, which is that's the genesis of the Academy of Thought and Industry. Uh, I met Ray and Matt several years ago. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, I don't know if you guys are celebrities around here or not, but uh, we'll make you into celebrities. Um, Ray is the CEO of Higher Ground, and Matt is director of lots of things. Um, everybody will make up titles. Um, but they, they saw that there was an alignment between kind of the thing I was doing, and I'd been involved in Montessori before. And so uh, um, Higher Ground hired me to create the Academy of Thought and Industry as a kind of cutting edge version of what a Montessori aligned secondary program might be. And so uh, you know, certainly my goal is to create many of these. We're opening schools in Austin, San Francisco, and New York this fall. I've got requests from about five other cities for fall of 2019. We want to create lots of Montessori-aligned high schools. And now that you kind of see the end point, I'm going to go back to this entrepreneurial mindset in Montessori. So um, going back to active versus passive, one of the things as an educator and as a parent is I am not too worried about my kid being exposed to a little bit of something bad here and there. What I'm really worried about is being kind of pickled in things that are not good day in, day out, week in, week out, for months and months or years and years. And so for me, as a parent and educator and a former student in school, um, the notion of kids being trained to be passive rule followers day in, day out, week in, week out, month after month for 13 years is just not okay. Um, again, 
some people are fine with that system. Some of my best friends like public school or regular school. Private, most private schools are the same. For me, I'm at a point where I, I really just can't bear it. Um, and part of that is, you know, I have no patience with lectures, but part of that is I just really respect agency in children. My goal is to liberate the genius in every young human being. And part of that is the agency. And the agency comes through practicing agency in an environment where you can be autonomous. Um, you know, if you're being trained to wait until you're told what to do every day, uh, you're not going to have as much agency than if you happen to be from the age of infancy on, empowered to explore your environment, to make decisions in your environment. And these become life, lifelong habits. I'll give you one uh, example of a piece that stuck. At one point, I was leading a Socratic seminar for adult uh, you know, professionals. And I said we didn't have to raise our hands because we we're just having an intellectual dialogue. But there were several of these people who, at the age of 50, had to raise their hands. Like, you guys, school's over. Forget it. We're done. You don't need to do this. But these habits become very deeply ingrained. Um, there's a whole literature on how many great entrepreneurs uh, had trouble in school. Sometimes you know, they were dyslexic. Sometimes they got in trouble by breaking rules. Sometimes they were kicked out. Uh, many of them were dropouts. You know, Richard Branson is a high school dropout. Uh, John Mackey, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates are all college dropouts. You know, for people that want to create things and take initiative, rule following is not the right thing. So now I'm going from not only initiative, but beyond initiative, the opportunity to construct what you're doing, your own activities. Not only to choose your own activities, but to be free within certain parameters. You know, we have to be respectful of others. But within certain parameters, to be free to kind of create the direction you're going to create. But if your expectation is that you need permission to do things before you do anything, um, and that is what is your daily life, you're going to be much less likely to have an entrepreneurial mindset. You will wait for some authority. This is also my anti-authoritarian anti thing. You're going to wait for some authority to tell you what to do and how to do it. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you're doing it in the right way with the right permissions and so forth. If we want our children to be incredible entrepreneurial creators, we need to give them the habits and attitudes and mindset year in, year out for decades, uh, the two most crucial decades before they're 20, so that they can go out in the world and do things. I'll give you a concrete example. When I created the school in Palo Alto, Montessori Middle Schools, half of our students had come up through Montessori and half came from public schools. And you know, these are Palo Alto families, very high income and so forth. But the kids who'd come up through Montessori, we put them in a, an environment, Montessori middle school classroom, but had a lot of autonomy. Those kids, ready to go. You know, they were instantly productive. They were engaged in interesting, valuable activities on day one. The kids who had been trained to be passive for six years, it took us a semester and in some cases a year to train them to take initiative, to be productive, to focus. Um, you know, and the good news is after a year we were able to eliminate most of the damage that had been done in the previous six years. I mean, I, I, have, I want to be apologetic, but I'm not. I, I'm really outraged that kids are trained to be passive uh, because all of the winners in our economy are not the, going to be the passive people. Um, you know, there's some people that manage to be active, take initiative, and so forth despite regular school. More power to you. I think, you know, I don't know if it's genetics, parents, whatever, but hurrah. Uh, but I know for a fact that there are kids who are being trained to be passive, who did not need to be trained to be passive, and that if we get them uh, early enough, we can train them to be active and take initiative. I mentioned another element, deep focus. So the Montessori work period, you have you know, solid, deep in focus. Uh, one of my favorite authors is a man named Cal Newport, who's an amazing uh, guru of learning. He's also a professor of computer science uh, at Georgetown, I believe, or maybe George Washington, but just an incredible guy who happens to be a world-class computer science professor who writes learning books on the side. But one of his themes in one of his books is focus is the new IQ. You know, people that can really focus in and get stuff done, solve hard problems, that's important. Um, if you are somebody who is only doing what is assigned and only doing it as long as you're assigned it, oh, I got my homework done, now can I play? Wrong, wrong, wrong. No, uh, if you want to get something important done in your life, you need not only to take initiative, you need to be able to focus on it and be serious about it for the long haul. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who uh, is part of Vista, 
an organization for entrepreneurs. He used to have a film company where he uh, did marketing films for hundreds of companies. He said, he and I were talking about how entrepreneurs have such different personalities. Um, you know, what do they have in common? And you know, at, at the extreme, so there's a guy named Bob Luddy who's creating a chain of low-cost schools in North Carolina. He also has a fume hood thing, you know, the commercial kitchens that have the fume hoods. It's one of the most successful manufacturers in North Carolina. But he's an accountant, and he very much has the mind of an accountant, but he's also very entrepreneurial and taking initiative. But his whole style of entrepreneurship is how can we shave cost? You know, that's sort of an accountant. Let's do a better job and let's make the building cheaper by this, this, and this. On the other hand, I um, also have worked with James Heckman, who is number two at Yahoo, is founder of Scout.com, scout uh, the Maven.net, uh, and you know has sold one company to Yahoo for forty million, another to um, Fox for hundred million. So very su successful entrepreneur, and he's crazy. He's just um, all over the place, crazy. He doesn't do the same thing. I was at a conference with him where. Um, he had a whole event planned for 100 VIP guests the next day, and at 2 in the morning he canceled it. Like, are you crazy? You're just going to tell all these VIPs you're canceling? Yeah, whatever. But, you know, he's effective. And so at the end of the day, as long as you are effective one way or another, uh, that's what matters. And so part of being effective is you've got to be able to really be focused and serious and go in a direction. And you can't be waiting for permission and you can't be easily dissuaded. Uh, one of the descriptions of entrepreneurship I have is it's like waking up every day and being punched in the gut, um, which is not fun. It's not the romantic pretty version, but you're going to have lots of disappointments. And you can't give up easily. So focus, persistence, you know, that kind of thing, really important. And part of, part of one of the things we want kids to do in Montessori is not give up. We want them to develop a longer and longer time span. At the elementary, it you know, gets longer and longer as they go up through grades. Ultimately, in high school, I want kids to be doing projects year round. So you know, I don't say, when they ask, how much homework do you have? I don't say, well, you're working year round. You've got a lot of homework. I say, no, it's as much as you assign yourself. And um, you know, we're going to have you establish goals. We'll enforce integrity. And if you are not meeting your goals, we'll take away privileges. But we want you to do something you love and that you're serious about and is meaningful to your life. And as a consequence, they're very serious about getting things done. Um, so entrepreneurial mindset in Montessori. There are these characteristics, taking initiative, having passion, deep focus, uh, being persistent, and those things are habits and attitudes that are being developed in a Montessori classroom. And if you look at the ways in which the kids learn to function day in, day out, versus in a regular school, again, there are some schools that have some elements of this. So um, I know a lot of wonderful educators that are kind of gently trying to move in this direction, uh, but they're trying to move slowly in a direction where we're already there and we're moving fast to go even faster. So with that uh, kind of entrepreneurial mindset in Montessori, now I want to switch to how this is the crazy part before bedtime, uh, how I see this as solving all sorts of important problems. But the three big ones I'll talk about are, um, you know, AI destroying jobs on the one hand. Uh, another one is solving world problems. And the third is actually equity and how to make this uh, more fair for everybody. And that's a concern for people in the private school world. So starting with uh, you know, AI and jobs, probably you're all seeing lots of headlines about how robotics and AI are destroying, are going to destroy many jobs, not just say truck driver jobs, but um, you know, lawyer, certain jobs in law and medicine and so forth. That the software, software is eating the world, in the uh, words of Mark Anderson, the venture capitalist. And software is eating the world. And anything that, can, that is the least bit routine is going to go very rapidly. So what is it that's not routine? Um, you know, that's a tricky question, but there are elements of all sorts of jobs that are less routine that involve more uh, understanding how value is created and taking initiative to go and create that value. At my school in Austin, I had a UX designer who was hired by Fortune 500 companies. Um, he, he was teaching a class for our kids on how to code apps. But I asked him, why is it that you get paid the big bucks by these Fortune 500 companies? Why don't they just outsource to India and pay people 1 20th of what you make? And he said, the secret is he knows, I know better than the customer what the customer wants. And when you think about it as an educator, is there a high school class in how to know better than the customer what the customer wants? Not exactly, but I think it through. I think you need to understand 
the world, human needs, human desires, human motivations. You need to understand kind of all sorts of aspects of the economy. You need to understand perception and marketing and cool. Um, you know, these are things that are not easy to uh, put in an instruction manual for the UX designer in India. Um, I, I use that particular example because, again, my wife is from Senegal, and we, we are working on creating a school in Senegal to provide some of this education because right now Senegal, again, most traditional countries, very passive. Uh, the Senegalese are trained to be passive uh, by the culture and by the schools, and she sees in terms of this AI uh, you know, there, there's, unless kids there learn how to take initiative, perceive the world, be creative, be entrepreneurial, they're screwed. They just, you know, there's no hope for poor Africans. So she has, she feels a sense of moral urgency to kind of provide some of this cultural DNA that we've got here, um, we in the U.S. at large, but we especially kind of in the cultural, creative, you know, Montessori entrepreneurial world that is almost entirely absent there. Um, but it can be transferred. It's you know slow bit by bit process, but we're creating a little pot of that in Senegal. Different example: um, Guatemala is ranked by some standards one of the most hierarchical countries on earth. By hierarchical, you know you respect those who are above you, whether it's you know, the priest, the boss, the uh, rich person, whatever, uh, the teacher. I was hired for a decade by a um, Guatemalan university to train their faculty to lead Socratic and encourage independent thought uh, so that their, in particular, their business schools could be more entrepreneurial. Because again, they want their people, they understand that Guatemala is going to remain poor if they're uh, hierarchical rule followers. The only way to create more prosperity there is to you know, increase this entrepreneurial value creation perspective, which means you know, breaking the rules and thinking for yourself. Um, you know, when you think, when I talk about value creation, it sounds pretty abstract, but what we have to think you know, going forward, what does the world need? Another definition of an entrepreneur that I love is an entrepreneur is somebody who stays awake at night thinking about what sucks and how to fix it. Um, you know, one kind of trivial example is I'm interested in the history of alarm clocks. I think some of us are old enough to remember the me, 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 horrible alarm clocks. Then there was the clock radio where you could put it on your favorite station and uh, listen to your favorite station with cheesy ads in the morning. Um, you know, now, of course, you can get alarm clocks with CDs and all kinds of different music. You can also get an alarm clock that goes from dark to light very gently. You can get a smell alarm clock that has beautiful scents wafting through the room to wake you up. You can actually get an alarm clock that either makes coffee or even cooks bacon by the side of your bed. So if you want to wake to the smell of coffee or bacon, that's out there. Um, Going to the other extreme, if you hit snooze too easily, you can buy an alarm clock that's a little uh, robotic device that runs around the room and you have to get out of the bed and chase it. So, you know, the experience of waking up sucks. How do you fix it? There's a whole innovation realm within the notion of alarm clocks. And, you know, rule followers would not have developed all these nifty, cool, different ways to wake up. Um, I'm very big on the notion of the experience economy, where uh, many people in the U.S. kind of have enough stuff. The next thing is quality of life. I actually see going from conventional schooling to Montessori as a huge upgrade of quality of life. But there have been some innovators uh, in San Francisco who, and there have been regulatory obstacles, but I think it's bit by bit can happen, are trying to improve the quality of life of the bus ride. So there were for a while buses that were like a coffee shop experience, sort of you know, very beautiful and elegant. You have your little espresso or latte or whatever, and quiet, and you could read and use your computer, great Wi-Fi. Um, you know, why can't you have a beautiful bus ride that's a cool experience? Um, I'm still wanting dentist's office to provide better experiences. Why is it, why is it boring? You know, ultimately, if we could get DMV to provide a great experience, wouldn't it be great to have a great experience at DMV? So one way to think about the experience economy is, as entrepreneurs, we should be working to create beautiful experiences from the moment people wake up to the moment people uh, go to bed. So this uh, algorithm, what sucks, how to fix it, we need to develop young people whose eyes are constantly looking out there, what is not as good as it could be and how can we fix it and how can we take initiative to fix it? What's the curriculum for that? Well, it's not easy. Again, that's not a, you know, a manual. It's not a, a PDF that you can send around. Um, there are lots of cool people doing bits and pieces of this in PDF form, but ultimately it's creating a culture where all of everybody in the culture is thinking, talking, arguing about these things. They're, they have an understanding of the world. They have the understanding of value creation. They have an understanding of entrepreneurship. Um, is, how many people here are familiar with the business model canvas? 
Okay, so business model canvas. Um, it's part of a whole lean startup model. There's a guy at Stanford called Steve Blank who teaches a course called How to Build a Startup. It's a great course. But one of, it's, it's sort of a simplified way to create businesses. And um, one of the key things is a value proposition. You know, everybody has to figure out what's the value proposition of your business. So business is not just about an idea, it's about creating value that is valued by somebody else and how do you produce that value in a consistent way. But even the notion of creating value, it's pretty abstract. Uh, we need to develop young people whose jobs won't be eaten up by the robots and by AI who are really good at creating value. And then once you start thinking like this, um, most of the entrepreneurs I know have lists of entrepreneurial projects. People say, how do I think of an entrepreneurial idea? The entrepreneurs I know have lists of dozens of projects they'll probably never get to in their life. Because once you start looking and thinking at the world like this, there are tons of them. Another niche that I'm excited about, and I, I get my students, when the students come to ADI, ATI, a lot of them are creators, and they're like, oh, there's so many cool things out there. So I, I don't talk to them about, well, you have to take history. Yeah, yeah, history. I love history. But you know, the real thing is, let's create. So um, another thing in experience is boutique hotel, hotels around the world, eco spas, eco resorts, beautiful places. You know, as more of us are traveling, we want to have really cool experiences around the world. And a lot of our young creators, like what I like to create, uh, beautiful uh, resorts around the world. Uh, I've got a lot of kids who are like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so you know, you want to think, you're going to get them excited about let's create cool things and let's create lives around this. And how do we do it? How do we begin doing this when they're young? So that's kind of AI and jobs. Uh, you know, people, sadly, and I, I am really afraid for the people who don't have this kind of education. Everybody who's stuck in rule-driven systems, where they're taught to raise their hand, where they need to ask permission to go to the bathroom, where they you know, uh, have no initiative, and it's, I'm not blaming them, I'm blaming a system that trains them not to have initiative, that penalizes them for having initiative. Those people, you know, are, are gonna be in really bad shape in the 21st century, and it is, you know, frankly terrifying. I mean, I think the opioid epidemic is kind of the beginning of it, and I think it's gonna get worse. So I feel a huge moral urgency to create and spread this kind of education doesn't need to be narrowly Montessori, but some kind of education that helps young people become entrepreneurial value creators um, by the time you know, they're adolescents and extend that. I see that as really important. And so that goes to the um, you know, next bit of you know, the equity. So often people think, oh, this is you know, only for people who can afford to pay, but I see it as conceptualizing education in the right way. If we allow a system that's based on, call it the you know, Carnegie credits, it's a standard operating system. Um, the standard school model has more market share than Microsoft ever had in the operating system space in the late 1990s. Um, it basically tells us that this is what third grade looks like, and this is what fourth grade looks like, this is what history looks like, and this is what science looks like. That operating system, pretty much all of the educational textbooks, uh, assessments, teaching materials, uh, everything is based on that kind of a system. And if you're trying to do something outside that system, it's really hard. I mean, I think you, you may not have any idea how hard it's been for the Montessori movement to get as far as it has uh, outside the existing standard. So, you know, Marie Montessori created this 100 years ago. It just about died uh, in the US until the late 1950s, early 60s, revived, and now it's growing well. But um, the academic, uni you know, the universities, the education departments have not provided training for Montessori. So the Montessori, there's a, now a couple of exceptions, but Montessori has had to uh, have its own training financed separately, typically through, you know, underpaid Montessori teachers who are trying to pay out of their own pocket for their own education without government loans. And at one point I calculated the average Montessori teacher sacrifices a million dollars in lifetime income relative to a standard uh, public school teacher. So this movement has gotten as far as it has by means of people doing this uh, because they believed in it. But if, if we had the same opportunities for financing Montessori education and training that are elsewhere, uh, all of a sudden it wouldn't be as difficult and expensive as it is. We've grown a lot. Um, we're trying to figure out ways to accelerate high quality Montessori training. But right now there's a massive system, K-12 and university, that does not help us at all. So part of getting to the point where this is higher quality, lower cost for everybody, is to have much better pipeline of training and talent. So we don't have to create everything independently. 
Um, I'm talking to a group called Silicon Schools Fund in the Bay Area, and they finance, you know, Silicon Valley types who finance innovative education. They financed about 50 schools. They, they're big on personalized education, which this is one form of personalized education. And they acknowledge uh, there isn't even any software that's good for this. Um, you know, we're, we're still kind of looking at software that's pretty good, uh, but all of, all of those systems are for that establishment over there. So we're kind of breaking away. But as we break away and people realize this is better, we'll find what entrepreneurs always do is they create higher quality, lower cost, and more niche production of whatever it is. And so we're beginning to do that despite the fact that we have all of the um, financial disadvantages via via the establishment. And I think at some point there's going to be a tipping point where most parents, uh, I, you know, personally, Sorry, I'm getting to the noise people, sound people. Personally, uh, I, you know, again, there's some personalities, some student types, maybe 20% of student personalities are great for regular school, but I think there are lots of kids who would do so much better than this, and as more parents realize the value of this for their child, for the 21st century, then I think it will spread, and it'll be easier for us to do high-quality, low-cost Montessori all over the place. So for me, it's a matter of going from a system that was established for various reasons back in the um, early 20th century. And some of those were political reasons, some bureaucratic reasons, some technological. Um, you know, the top-down thing was very simple to manage. And that system grew throughout the 20th century. It was obsolete, I think, decades ago. Uh, because of inertia and stasis, it's been very hard to change. But at this point, uh, I think there are a lot of people that realize we can't afford not to give our kids you know, creative, critical thinking, initiative, deep focus that is characteristic of this kind of world. So I'm very passionate about uh, not only bringing kids uh, through a Montessori education all the way through high school, but also creating a mainstream where we recognize the kind of agency that children have in Montessori is absolutely essential for anyone in the 21st century uh, to reliably have a great life as an entrepreneurial value creator, no matter what particular domain or industry or expertise they happen to have. So I probably um, you know, overstated my case about 50 times, and maybe I wasn't quite uh, crazy enough and outrageous for enough for you. But um, at this point, I would love to open it up to questions. I guess one question is, so in an ideal world, how would you imagine like secondary education, post high school, like college education, what would that look like? Oh, that's a really great question. So first of all, let me go a little bit more deeply into the model of the Academy of Thought and Industry because I'm actually doing this and uh, then we'll talk about post-secondary. Um, so we have three required classes, um, a life design course, a Socratic Humanities and Math Problem Solving. And beyond that, students may take their choice of project-based courses or academic courses. Um, within that, we start by having students set goals, and the program is aligned with their goals beyond those three required courses. And their three required courses are designed to kind of give them you know, breadth, and there's still a lot of autonomy within those courses. So you know, the life design course, we have one segment that is practical external efficacy. It includes goal setting, time management, project management, you know, skills. If they're going to be an independent creator, there are a set of uh, practical skills they need to learn to master. There's also a day devoted to futurism. Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, uh, the most successful entrepreneurial incubator in Silicon Valley, talks about the best way to uh, create a successful company is to live in the future and see what's missing. So as a consequence, we have a whole segment devoted to futurism and prediction and understanding trends. So the students, much more than they would on their own, are living in the future. Uh, I, I follow a lot of trends. One can't keep up with everything, but it's amazing. I mean, the, pay, the rate of change is really dazzling. So if you start with an idea that looks like a decent idea now, if you're not paying attention to what's probably going to happen five years from now, no way. So we have another strand devoted to that. There's also an intrapersonal strand. We need to be kind of masters of our own uh, you know, thoughts, emotions, ways of dealing with stress. We need to be able to manage ourselves. And um, I think we've taken that for granted, but it's a sophisticated skill. Just a relevant rant, one third of American adolescents are on prescription medication. I think there's something really wrong with a society where one third of the kids are on prescription medication. Um, there's an epidemic of uh, depression, suicide, self-harm, eating disorders. Um, you know, it's, it's really an issue. I'm not saying the intrapersonal will solve all of that. The whole program is an attempt to address a lot of this. But uh, 
it's not easy being a teenager in the United States today. Um, just to think about how radically we've changed in a traditional culture, you would become what your father or mother were. So usually, you know, if your father was a baker, you would be a baker, and you didn't have to think about you know, creating a life. Now, um, there's no coherence at all. There are so many influences, uh, any of them not necessarily positive. And so it's a lot of difficulty being a teen. So intrapersonal, um, and then finally, an interpersonal. Uh, relationships are critical. Google actually did a study that their most productive employees were not the um, autistic geeks alone. And I love my autistic geeks. I might be partly autistic. I don't know. but. Um, <laughs> You know, it was people who work well with other people. And so a lot of our work is group work, interactive work, and we train students how to interact constructively. We train them in both uh, nonviolent communication and clean talk, and also just uh, how to have difficult conversations, challenging conversations. We talk about all kinds of relationships. We talk about friendship and romantic relationships and parents and siblings and um, peers. You know, we want them to be well empowered. So that's life design, Socratic humanities. We read, think, talk about ideas all the time. Uh, we read a lot of classic texts. But mostly the students are taking initiative intellectually. One of the reasons I loved St. John's is we could have our own thoughts. Um, I'm very committed to developing the intellectual agency of my students. And it's in a context where people argue and disagree. So uh, there are constraints. But still, students love having intellectual agency. They will want to explore the world. Um, then the math problem solving is designed so that they use, learn to use math as a tool to solve real world problems. You know, engineering, design, physics, math. Um, you know, if they just learn uh, the linear curriculum, sometimes they'll have a great teacher who gets into a lot of problem solving, but great mathematical thinkers use math as a tool to really solve problems. And we want to train that kind of again, habits and attitudes, how to think mathematically. As a relevant aside, um, I'm fascinated with you know, spectacular successes in education. Uh, for people that are into math, 20, the Hungarian mathematicians were some of the most spectacular mathematicians of the 20th century. Um, people like John von Neumann and Paul Erdős, you know, superstars from Hungary, and Hungary is a tiny country. Uh, how do they produce such amazing mathematicians? It turns out late 19th century Hungary had a group of math educators who had intense math problem solving competitions where it was part of the culture for um, them to argue, think, talk about math all the time. And it was competitive with these national exams and, uh, you know, and they were not just simple questions, they were like math problem solving competitions. And these, these guys became incredible, just truly incredible. So this notion of a culture of problem solving is really important. So that's the three required courses. Beyond that, it's projects and or you know, project courses or academics. So we offer advanced placement courses. If somebody wants to go to MIT or Stanford, they need to demonstrate their academic chutzpah by doing well in a few AP courses. They don't need to do lots of AP, but they need to do a few to demonstrate they can. Um, and then spectacular projects. If they're gonna to go to RISD or Parsons School of Design, they need to be able to do some amazing creative project. It turns out even to go into elite academic colleges, doing amazing projects is valuable. Only 3% of American students go to competitive, really competitive colleges, but that sort of drives a lot of attitude towards college admissions. Um, but you know, I know a guy who used to be director of admissions at Yale, and he said he'd much rather have somebody who was, had done something real and important in the world than just did the usual varsity sports, student council, orchestra, volunteer work, high GPA, blah, 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 blah. I've been on scholarship committees where you wake up on a Saturday morning, you have a stack of 300 applications to read, and they all look the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you get to this kid who dropped out of high school to join a Buddhist monastery, went back. If nothing else, that's the one you remember after reading 300 you know, applications. <laughs> so there, there's actually a group of Ivy League graduates who have a consulting business on how to help your high school senior become interesting. I'm like, you guys, <laughs> let's just be interesting. <laughs> let's not try to pay somebody to teach us to be interesting when we were, you know, the last year. So, you know, a lot of it is, uh, you know, passion. Uh, the one admissions criterion we have is purpose-driven. So what we do is we have a, a community of purpose-driven teens. They come in, we have them set goals and create a program that's aligned with their purpose. We create a really warm, supportive, emotionally, um, you know, supportive community for them and then develop their purpose. You know, Malcolm Gladwell has 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become world class. And I tell the kids coming in, let's get started on your 10,000 hours now. You know, if you are gonna be a filmmaker, uh, let's start creating incredible films now. Let's fail, let's have a bunch of bad films. You know, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, let's start a company and let's have, you know, fail faster in Silicon Valley. Let's fail lots. Um, but you know, they have to be trying real world stuff on their path to world class excellence. So for me, I actually saw, read a wonderful book 
called um, Lessons from Extraordinary Ed Educators. And um, this guy said there are three elements to do incredible success. He had studied like this cheerleading team in Kentucky that always won national championships, or this debate team in Texas at one state over and over again, or you know, these isolated things. And he said, it's probably not the water, you know? <laughs> Something else going on. So he went and looked at these educators, and what he found were three things. One is, clearly, they loved and respect the kids that they were working with. You know, there's this sense of real love, respect, and trust with kids. Second was very high expectations. They had the expectation those kids could be world class. And third, the kind of technical expertise to coach them to world-class expertise. And I see that as a, you know, a simple algorithm, if you will, for how to create extraordinary excellence. And what's tricky about that is um, it's hard to, uh, often hard to find, say, teachers who are both good at the love and warmth on the one hand and high expectations. Say a lot of teachers are either good on the nurturing, not so good on the high expectations, or very demanding, not so good on the nurturing. It's sort of a you know, tension but once you can kind of get that right, and you can both be clearly loving, warm, and supportive, and, and I expect absolute world-class excellence, and then you train them, and you create an esprit de corps around that, kids do it. And so I see that whether it's chess or math or um, writing or whatever it is. You know, let's, let's create this esprit de corps around being amazing. And then that's ultimately my thing is that, and this kind of goes back to you, you know, what, what does the program look like? Some way to support being amazing. And it may not be evident, but one of the challenges actually is even um, I always hire people who've had some real world experience because if they've only been in education, again, they're stuck in that operating system. Um, you know, literature course is great, but if somebody's whole world is how am I going to be a good literature course and how do I teach, you know, Huck Finn again for the 30th time, they're not looking at, uh, you know, what is it like to become a world class writer and how do you really uh, create this esprit de corps to become a world class writer. So anybody whose boundaries of the disciplines are based on existing academic systems is not looking at this 10,000 hours to excellence. And nobody who hasn't been out in the world, and especially I want people who have been entrepreneurial in the world, again, happy if they're an educator, they went out and tried a company and failed it, wonderful. You know how hard it is to do something in the real world. You know, those kind of people are going to be better at coaching these students through all of these experiences so they, so they get there. So that was kind of high level abstract. I'll just dive briefly into the post-secondary. So post-secondary, um, I'm very interested in those people that are so amazing that they don't need regular credentials. It turns out, by the way, that the only college degrees that provide a positive ROI right now are either STEM degrees, which are still great, or elite college degrees. Um, but if you're not in STEM and you don't have an elite college degree, it's not clear that college is a good investment. And right now, people talk about a college bubble where there are you know, hundreds of thousands of students who have lots of student loans and who got, I would say, sadly, a not very valuable degree, but still have the loans to pay back. Meanwhile, are things like General Assembly and Coding Academy. Is General Assembly is a offers, say, six-week courses in coding, UX design, digital marketing, social media strategy, real 21st century skills. And I see people coming out of Harvard with an English degree who are unemployable. They go to General Assembly for six weeks and can get a job. Uh, why not just go to General Assembly and, you know, sure, if you want to study literature for four years at Harvard, fine. But in terms of job readiness, places like General Assembly are much better. Different example, uh, App Academy is a place in San Francisco that costs zero up front, but uh, they take 7% of, seven, might be 17, I think 17% of your first year salary. But their average graduate makes more than 100000 a year. So this is another you know, six-week coding academy where, you know, six weeks, uh, you can make 100000 a year. They take 17%. You don't have to pay any money up front. Um, and that makes more sense than most college degrees. It's very competitive to get into. But uh, competitive, not in terms of grades or test scores, they want bright think people who can think on their feet. Uh, I, rec I had somebody I know who went through the program recently and said one of the um, application questions was how many uh, uh, basketballs fit in a school bus. And they wanted to ha see if you could think through an unstructured problem on your feet quickly. Again, how do you do that? It's not the same sort of thing as uh, just you know, preparing for tests, you need to be able to think on your feet. Something like our math, math problem solving is better for that. So those sorts of uh, opportunities are fast, quick. Um, really, you can learn anything online, uh, but there are these specialty schools that provide special value. And I see lots of people getting sort of just-in-time learning in all sorts of different ways, a la carte, all over the place. Um, you know, I still think PhD mathematicians will have a role. So for people who want to go to MIT and get a PhD and uh, help us create new math, 
fabulous, but I think for a lot of people, uh, conventional college is becoming uh, less and less of a good investment and less valuable. Um, so the, uh, finally, I think we'll see more innovations in the post-secondary market. Um, I think it's ripe for entrepreneurial creative destruction. And I think there will be thousands and thousands of colleges that go out of business and they will be replaced by all sorts of new uh, entrepreneurial schools. So that's a short, yeah, short, short by my standards answer, uh, but thank you. <laughs> a great question. Open it up to another one. So when I learned math when I was in high school, right. um, when I learned algebra and calculus, what I did was I listened to lectures and read, and then I just solved problems. Right. So how does your method of teaching differ from, in particular with math, right. how no, does it differ from traditional method? No, that's a great, great question. So first of all, we have two pieces. I talk more about the math problem solving. That's you know, a group, we give them interesting hard problems. Sometimes problems from, say, math competition problem sets where it requires kind of thinking in a new way. If you were, um, you know, the, the, the hardest word problems kind of move away from the kind of simple structure of the algorithms you're taught to solve uh, you know, basic algebraic problems. So the more kind of innovative you have to be in terms of thinking of a way to get at something, the better I see it in terms of learning to be a math problem solver. Um, George Polya, who is a great Hungarian, another great Hungarian mathematician, wrote a book called uh, How to Solve It. He said it's better to have one problem you learn, figure out six ways to solve than to solve um, the same, same kind of problem six times. And so you want that kind of flexibility in mathematical thinking. So that's more on the math problem solving side. On the, what I call the linear math curriculum, which in the US is the standard algebra one, geometry, algebra two, pre-calc, calc, calc. Um, that curriculum we use Khan Academy. And Khan Academy is often known for its videos, but for us, more than the videos, it's about, um, it provides incredible metrics for individualized tracking. So we can see exactly, sort of big brother aspect, we can see exactly how many problems, how many minutes, um, which problems you're getting wrong systematically. And so it allows our guides to be really fine-tuned in coaching because of those sophisticated back-end metrics. And then we train students to become better autodidacts. So at our last school, the first year, there was a lot of complaining from the students of, oh, this is so hard to learn on our own. Uh, but we mostly ask questions in order to get them, instead of giving them the answer or even giving them a lesson, um, ask questions. Even, you know, have you watched the video? Have you read this explanation? Um, have you checked your work? Did you look at this? So again, it's Socratic in that sense, asking them questions. But then ultimately, what that does is it shifts the responsibility from, um, I have to wait patiently until a teacher teaches me to, Dang, they're going to expect me to figure it out even when the teacher is sitting right next to me. Um, and then we train students to do that with each other as well and ultimately create a culture where you learn how to work through math. And the math problem solving is uh, you know, more instructed. The Khan Academy, we give some lessons, but we've created a really successful culture where students um, learn how to figure out math with minimal uh, external assistance and they also learn how to help each other in a really big way. Um, just as an aside in terms of uh, students helping students, there's, there's a whole literature on the best way to learn something is to teach it. And of course, we don't want you know, our students to have to teach uh, you know, instead of doing the, all the learning, but little bits of teaching are incredibly helpful for students to learn. Um, there was a system in the late, uh, well, really around 1800, late 17th, or late 18th, early 19th century, where they had a teacher-student ratio of 100 to 1, 500 to 1, 1,000 to 1, because it was systems of uh, students teaching students. And that system had scaled to, uh, from beyond Britain to India to Russia to the US to the Cherokees to Latin America. It was kind of going global, and then top-down uh, government education pretty much destroyed it. But there is a precedent in terms of scaling education by means of student, students teaching students. In Senegal, where my wife and I are doing that, we're having the students train the other students. Um, one other feature, and I'm skipping away from math, is we do allow students when they want to actually teach their own courses. And I have a brilliant student in Austin who taught an improv course. And uh, he did an excellent job. And he is actually writing up an improv set of improv lessons for our life design. As he argued, he persuaded me that improv is really a cool way to learn how to be flexible and uh, versatile in how you interact with people. So we're going to have a strand of improv within the interpersonal piece of that that is based on the course that he taught and is now documenting for us. Um, so yeah, a lot of in, you know, putting the responsibility back on the students. In some ways, my goal as an educator is to create great autodidacts. Um, one thing as an adult is I, I'm 
pretty capable of learning pretty much anything on my own quickly and easily. I know some things are hard. You know, it, it takes some work to do some stuff, but still, uh, in principle, I, I can learn anything. And so I went to train students so they can learn anything. Um, you know, and, and that's, again, a kind of form of the Montessori, uh, the goal of success of the teacher is when they are acting as if I'm not even there. So our, our goal with the math is for the students to be such good autodidacts they can work with each other. I'll give you one other sort of metaphor of teaching. I like to kind of stretch people outside their boxes. I once had a, um, a rabbi come and visit my Socratic classes, and he said, this is just like what we did in Talmudic school in terms of the students arguing with each other about ideas all the time. And he said the model there was um, the students were only asked to ask the chief rabbi a question once a week, and he was behind velvet curtains. And so you have to go upstairs and kind of peel back the velvet curtains and ask permission to ask the rabbi a question. You know, and so that's such a different model from total dependency on the student. I'm on the teacher. The rest of the week, the students were just arguing the Talmud all the time with each other, and they'd say their deepest and hardest questions they couldn't do on their own once a week to the rabbi. So we won't be quite that extreme, but you know, I want the students to be serious autodidacts, uh, and I will almost anything they ask me, I'll put it back as a question. And it annoys them all over the place at first, but eventually they realize, OK, it's on me. And that's what I want. So great question. Thank you. Uh, other questions? You may have the best classrooms, the best materials, the best everything, but if you don't have a great teacher that's able to inspire and guide and ask the questions that you said and all those things, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. So where do you find those teachers, the ones that are going to inspire the generation? How do you retain them for them not to go into the traditional mm -hmm. schooling and keep them advancing and going for them to make a bigger impact in their kids? No, that's a great question. I'll, I'll sort of do two different answers. One is, um, I'll, again, I'll acknowledge in the Montessori world it's been really challenging in part because um, Montessori training has been almost entirely outside the conventional system of getting degrees and getting student loans and all of that. And that's a huge problem. So that's an institutional problem I'd like to solve. Before maybe addressing that a little bit more, I want to go to the secondary level, whereas at the secondary level, I have hundreds of great applicants who are begging me to teach there. I've got people happy to start part-time and go full-time. I have people willing to move across the country uh, with, you know, even given a lot of, you know, they, no guarantee that they have a long-term job. Um, it turns out, especially in the humanities, I think for people who love learning, who love reading and thinking about ideas, um, I'll blame No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind has made it hard to do the kind of education many people love in uh, public high schools, and then universities are becoming kind of more bureaucratic and politicized, and it's harder there. I've had several, uh, my uh, humanities teacher in San Francisco is somebody who's been a visiting fellow at both Stanford and Harvard, and he's taught classes at Stanford and Harvard, and he could you know, teach at any number of universities. He would much rather teach in this environment because we're much more focused on meaning and purpose and doing what's right for the kid. So right now, we have this plethora of people super eager to teach for us. And I, I think you know, often, uh, we're, the US continues to turn out PhDs. Most of the PhDs are never going to get a job. But the academic job market is totally hopeless. And right now, um, you know, some of those people go and become depressed. And I'm saying, you guys, We've got these amazing kids. They're so much fun to work with. Uh, let's do really cool things with them. And I can redu I, I could reject PhDs day in, day out for, for years in terms of the, the pipeline of candidates. I want more uh, uh, training for them. And so one of the things we want is I'm envious of the Montessori world, all the training that Montessori has. So uh, likewise, you know, I'll have to create internal training. We're doing that. But um, um, ultimately, it's uh, going back to the systems thing. It's right now the system. Uh, does not support this alternative. Again, it's a dominate operating system. All of the money and power is over there. We need to get bigger and more powerful. And one of the things that make, gives me hope too is, um, you know, a lot of the parents are very influential. And I think as we have more influential parents, you know, famously both uh, the Google founders, Jeff Bezos, or Montessori educated, um, and part of the Silicon Schools Fund, the per personalized education is wealthy Silicon Valley types that realize that the old system is obsolete. I think at a glacial pace, uh, the, the money, power, and influence are moving our direction. And uh, you know, we need to just keep evangelizing and telling people this is what the right thing to do. And we need to have systems that support us. We don't continue to do it on our own. 
Um, so that's not satisfying in the short run necessarily, but uh, you know, part of, part of what I see myself doing is, the, I, I know a lot of Montessorians who've been in this for decades, and my heart goes out because it's been hard for decades. I think our time is coming. I think one of the big things about going all the way through high school is um, very often right now, if you're in Montessori, you're thinking, well, at some point we have to satisfy the conventional system. We break through and you know, get kids into great colleges. All of a sudden, there is no longer any reason to keep that existing system intact. So right now, we have to compromise. We as Montessorians have to compromise what we're doing. Um, it turns out that college is much more like Montessori. You have more autonomy, more choice. You get to pick what you love. You can do you know, projects. You get a real job if you want. So I see high school as kind of the last you know, alien bottlenecks. It's locked in. And so we want to shatter that, break through, um, get you know, all of influential people to say, come on, this is the right way to do it. Uh, the research is there that you know, agency is incredibly important for student learning, and we can do agency like nobody else. So uh, yeah, in the short run, we still have challenges in terms of creating great jobs for Montessori teachers, but I think that uh, we're, I'm hoping that we'll see a Berlin Wall moment in the next 10, 15 years, where we'll, the old system will start to shatter and we'll win. So hopefully, if, that gives you a little bit of hope, even if it's not a definitive how-to. Um, other questions? Stephen Lee is wondering, thanks for a very interesting presentation. What can we as parents do to foster a culture slash environment of entrepreneurship with our kids when they're at home? Great question. So first of all, I think respecting autonomy and agency and encouraging autonomy and agency is really important. Um, so I think one of the great things about a Montessori classroom is it provides a set of norms um, and I think of them as kind of norms for behavior that as one continues those in the home, it naturally continues a lot of those traits. In addition, and part of this depends on the developmental stage of the student, um, I think it's really valuable to begin to talk to them about the world of entrepreneurship and the future and creation and innovation. Um, give them a sense for you know, what is what is value creation mean? I and mean, most most say 10 year olds are not going to understand what value creation means. We have to kind of walk through it. Why do you think we like to go to that restaurant instead of that restaurant? Why do we like to go to that store rather than that store? How do you think, you know, how is it that Bill Gates made money? And how is it that, you know, some people make money? And why would you get paid? Why would somebody pay you to do a job? You know, in some ways, again, I'm always Socratic. Um, as adults, we have a sense for how the world works. And we need to share that sense with our children. But instead of lecturing on them, you know, this is the global economy. No, let's uh, gradually ask questions to see how they're thinking through. By the way, I, I do a weekly um, Socratic dialogue with a five-year-old. Uh, her name is Alana, uh, and I post it on YouTube. And there, I demonstrate how to do Socratic dialogue with a five-year-old. You'd think, oh, you know, five-year-old can't. She's amazing. She's brilliant. But a lot of this is training her to think. And you see her, you know, her eyes going back and forth. Hmm, not sure. And that's what you want. You want to have your kids thinking and trying to make sense of the world. They have amazing minds. The world is incredibly complex. None of us understand the world adequately. So you want to have their minds working on various questions with the world. And then as they get older and as they get a sense for you know, entrepreneurial value creation, and as they get a sense for their own particular passions, uh, then you can support them in starting companies. And you know, I've had kids uh, create companies, you know, search engine optimization companies, web companies. I had a kid who created a web uh, site for a, an American Idol finalist. I have another kid who actually did a um, concert promotion business where he was booking bands, booking venues, and selling tickets and making thousands of dollars a year. So once they're you know, kind of seeing the world like that, then as they get older, but you can get them seeing the world like that even when they're children. Um, I actually have a girl coming in whose parents are entrepreneur in San Francisco. She's coming into ATI. And she's 13, and um, she is one of the most sophisticated thinkers about entrepreneurial value creation uh, I've met outside of high-level Silicon Valley types. And clearly, she grew up in a home where her parents were entrepreneurs and are always talking about, you know, how do we do this? How do we do that? And she's been listening and absorbing. So you want your kid to absorb this kind of entrepreneurial value creation thought process. And right, then when they're a little bit older, uh, let's, let's look at how you can match your passion with your skills and talents and create an opportunity to go sell things. Finally, I, I do like to just have people go and sell things. So an exercise that I, I've done before is to have um, these are teenagers go up to a stranger and give them a rose. And it's, you know, it's just kind of breaking through that. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurship is sales. And 
most of schooling doesn't support sales, but you know, it's simple. There you're not even selling anything, but people are freaked out. What? Walk up to a stranger? Let's just try it. But go ahead. Tony Escobar is wondering, can we expect all the entrepreneurial char characteristics to develop naturally in children via the Montessori method of education? Or are there any gaps we should fill as parents and educators to encourage this mindset? Great questions. So first of all, also, as with almost everything, I expect there's a normal, normal distribution. So just like some kids are incredibly inc crazy about doing math, and other kids less so. Some kids love to read and write, other kids less so. Some kids are going to be incredibly entrepreneurial, and some kids less so. And so I, I would say that I think some personalities are just you know, not entrepreneurial, and that's OK. We need all kinds of people. Again, as a parent and educator, I want to respect the genius of my child. And as passionate as I am about entrepreneurship, if that's not my kid's thing, I don't want to force it on my kid. Um, that said, for the households that are entrepreneurial and the kids are entrepreneurial, at some point, certainly in, at the secondary level, we do, we do a version of Steve Blank's Stanford course on how to build a startup. Um, if you're not already, already familiar with um, the Business Model Canvas, which is part of that course, that's a really useful set of tools. There's also a man called uh, John Chisholm, um, who's a successful entrepreneur, and he has a book on you know, basically how to be an entrepreneur. It's, there are toolkits. The way I would look at it is, um, at our school at ATI, we will introduce students to these various toolkits that provide more specific information beyond Montessori Elementary. And certainly, as students get older, um, I think a bright entrepreneurial Montessori 13-year-old is ready for a version of Stanford's graduate course on how to build a startup. Uh, but you, know, you may have to help them out a little bit with that. So yes, more, give them the tools. Hi, I wanted to ask about your views um, towards technology in the classroom, mm -hmm. especially in the high school classroom. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to introduce that? Do you oppose to it? Because I'm very familiar with mm -hmm. the Montessori views in the toddlers and right. grade school. But in terms of high school, I want to hear your views towards sure. technology. So technology is a tool. I use technology. We all use technology all the time. It can also be an addiction. And so first, I, w I always make a distinction between kind of passive consumption and active creative use. So for instance, uh, you know, Google Docs is a tool. Spreadsheets are tools. Um, coding is certainly a very powerful tool. So uh, I'm, in that sense, agnostic. I very much want creativity rather than passivity. So active engagement is one thing. Passive is another. That said, um, much of our day is, uh, for us, interpersonal presence is important. So one of the things we do is a lot of activities is you know, uh, if we're having a conversation, whether it's in life design or Socratic, whatever, of course you're not on your cell phone. That would be extremely rude. Um, so we're present with each other in all of our interpersonal group activity. As adults, much of our time will be spent interacting with human beings. So insofar as a technology, and especially the addictive side of technology, can prevent us from our commitments to be present with other people and work, um, then it can be disadvantageous. And insofar as it is not being used as a creative, active tool. So much of our school day is uh, interpersonal and you know, being present. Um, technology, Khan Academy is certainly online. Again, we use it as a tool all over the place. But it's, it's something, a tool, you pick it up and use it when you need it. You're not. Uh, yeah, addicted to it and dependent on it and using it to escape your responsibilities. So that's kind of the, the philosophical line. Probably 80% of our time is interpersonal, 20% on technology. And at home they use it more um, and we can't control what they do, but we want to inculcate these ha habits of creation rather than an activity rather than passivity and being present in relationships. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, in response to the kind of facetious comment you made on dismissing history and study right. of history, right. um, I'm curious how looking into the past informs your futurism thread that you also described. That's a great question. So the way, and, and, and really the, the thing there is, um, my concern is with the academic disciplines believing that the boundaries of those disciplines are in any sense adequate. So it's not against literature or history per se. It's about the notion that um, the academic standards that have set certain boundaries uh, are adequate. So for instance, I'm extremely, you know, we do read Confucius, and I'm extremely interested in how Confucianism is alive in certain East Asian cultures. I'm very interested in how Judaism and Christianity 
um, and you know, Greek rationality have influenced the West. I'm very interested in you know, Islam and how it's influenced Islamic countries. So for me, uh, the way in which cultural movements are, the way I explain it to students actually is, you know, our brain is our hardware, then we've got the software, and the software down at the operating system level uh, may be these world civilizations and world belief systems that are really foundational. So in that sense, I, I re regard it as really important even to understand the present to understand that. But that is different than an academic understanding uh, or a typical academic understanding. I think great you know, teachers and professors always incorporate the real value of worldviews when they're teaching a portion of history. But there's a version of teaching history where one is supposed to know, I mean, the, the tr most tri trivialized version are you know, certain dates. Uh, you know, Confucius did this and such and such when. But even there, um, there are also somewhat more sophisticated versions where one reads a description of Confucianism and a description where somebody said it was influential. That's very different than asking, um, you know, do you believe that you've been influenced by this cultural tradition or that? Do you believe that you should respect your parents more as was in the Confucian culture? Or is it okay to be as disrespectful as many students are? How do we measure what the right way is to disrespect? You know, for the right way to disrespect. You know, Socrates is put to death for corrupting the young. Um, so there, maybe there's a right way to disrespect. So for me, it's all about uh, all, all knowledge is valuable as a way to understand the world. I see it as a lens through which we understand the world. And that's the difference between dead knowledge and live knowledge, that if it's a lens through which we're understanding the world, it's valuable. If it's something that uh, somebody in a, put in a curriculum because it's part of uh, you know, a committee 100 years ago said this is high school, you know, biology and history and whatnot, it's meaningless. And just to give you a sense of the scale of uh, how meaningless it is, um, the three branches of government is a standard and has been a national standard in US history courses in both middle school and high school for many decades, even before standards. You know, everybody was taught the three branches of government. It turns out only 25% of Americans can name the three branches of government. And there are about 32% of Americans have a college degree. So fewer Americans remember the three branches of government than have a college degree, even though it's something that we've been teaching. So whenever I see all these public debates about, should we teach X in the schools? Like, are you crazy? It's not getting through anyway. You know, these debates are completely meaningless. Most kids are just not, you know, not getting it, uh, getting the memorize and forget thing. So I think that kind of focus on, you know, what are we teaching? Uh, for me, it's much more important. What is sticking? What are they learning is the real question. And, and that's, you know, it's kind of like spaghetti. Does it stick on the wall? We don't stick on the wall. Um, other questions? I'm wondering if Montessori herself had a view on entrepreneurship or business in general and what that was, or if not, are you just interpreting her views in your No, that's a great question. Way? So, you know, the one thing she did on secondary school was the Erdkinder essay. So Montessori started with preschool, went up through elementary, down through infancy, and she wrote one thing on middle school, and it's an essay called Erdkinder, Earth Children. But it included having students run a business, uh, run a bed and breakfast, and you know, grow vegetables on a farm. It was kind of a farm school kind of concept. So. Uh, you know, that was, this was uh, early 20th century, and so she didn't have the kind of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial uh, vision that we might have today, 100 years later. But certainly having, you know, and even going back to practical life, you know, you see kids, you know, chopping vegetables and whatnot. She very much had a real world orientation, which I think uh, includes for her a business orientation and getting things done orientation. So, you know, certainly I'm extrapolating some themes, uh, 100 years later in today's economy. But it, there's also, I think, a very legitimate uh, direction that she was moving in, that this is in no sense an unnatural extension of uh, where she is. And I think one of, the th one of the things we all want to do is to think, I think we want to see Maria Montessori as a living, breathing thinker, where she would have adopted her thought to the world as it changes. And I think, um, yeah, if she was alive today, it's like, well, of course, they, they need to be players in the 21st century economy. That, that's one thing where it's, you know, I, I even think right now, farm school is great. Farm school is more appropriate 100 years ago. But now, you know, we want kids to be productive members of society who are part of real life. She had a really deep commitment to real life. Um, and that, that's, again, something that I think we want our kids to have a commitment to is real life. So that's, that's my case for the continuity uh, between Montessori and uh, the kind of direction I'm taking it. But 
Thank you. Um, thank you. Fabulous questions, fabulous audience. Uh, and I'm fanatic about all of this, so if anybody wants follow-up, uh, I'll keep you know, talking with you endlessly and give you more books than you'd ever read.